Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Corlick from Figure It Out Productions. The following video is a video of some kind, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey everyone, welcome to the Figure It Out cast for, what is this, April uh, 2023. I'm your host, Adam Corlick, along with uh, the evil Rob Thanos. Welcome back. Hey, hey, hey. And of course, we have Joseph, who is a Patreon backer, who is at the tier in which he gets to join us on this podcast. Welcome back, dude. Glad to be back here, Adam. <laughs> Yeah, also, I appreciate it's weird to be it. here in the beginning, honestly. I'm I know bit. this is usually usually Abdullah is, but for recording schedule reasons, like he's going to come into the second half instead. So uh, he's you know uh, just a little busy today. So we just thought we'd rather than you know trick you guys and make it sound like it's all out of order. We're no, we're going legit. We're going straight on through. So if you're brand new here, you've never uh, listened to this before. This is a Patreon backed podcast uh, in which you get access to it pretty much the day we record it. You also get access to all my videos on my channel early. Uh, you can also also win little prizes that I give out sometimes some digital keys but you can also have shout outs on here if you ever want to you can pick subjects and you can even be on the show just like Joseph is so thank you very much Joseph um we will start uh by going with your subject first you good to go um yep all right so I'm just gonna read this the way you wrote it and you can elaborate if you want uh the question was how long should a single game be support, supported for by developers? In cases where the game has been supported and is getting updates for years, do we think it's possible to get to the point where the team should have stopped and put the added features into a sequel or free updates and, uh, and DLC? So I like this question because this kind of made me think a lot. Like we, This is a question that was only even possible in the last like you know 15 years, right? So Because we're old and I think we're all kind of used to like when a game came out, it was you know kind of done. Um, when you said how long should a single game be supported for, my interpretation of that question when I first read it, although maybe I was wrong, was like a single player game, or did you mean like any one game? Um, I meant any one game, but generally like a multiplayer game obviously needs to be supported longer because otherwise it just falls apart. But Right. So that makes sense. So, like, a game like, you know, um, uh, Overwatch or something, they're going to kind of support that, you know, forever until the second one comes out and then they forget the first one ever existed. And um, completely like, erase the first one from everyone's computers. Precisely, <laughs> precisely. Uh, that's one type of uh, subject. The other would be something like, say, The Witcher 3, which they are still releasing DLC for, uh, that they're still giving away for free, and that even though that's a single-player experience. Um, I guess, on the surface... I would argue anything that's online, you know, dependent, you, if you're really making a big thing out of it, it should be supported for extraordinarily long time, depending on the popularity of the game. The longer it lives, the longer it's supported. I mean, like, GTA V is still getting updates, isn't it? That game is over 11 years old? Yeah, I, right? I think technically that one is more just GTA Online that's getting the updates. I think, I mean, I don't know much about, like, how... GTA actually works. I think the actual story has been pretty done for a while. Yes, but I, I mean, it all it is it is all under the umbrella of a single game. Like, you need GTA, GTA 5 to launch GTA Online, do you not? True. That, that, so that it's, is true. It's just, it's the online component of that game. I'm not saying that they're releasing free DLC for the single player part. I'm just using it as an example of A, a game that has been, you know, supported for quite some time, and B, one that is doing so because of its online capabilities. In fact, outside of The Witcher 3, I can't think of a single player game that has had that level of constant updates. I think they literally just did updates for it, like, a month ago with new DLC. Uh, the only other exception I can think of is uh, when companies release, like... Um, current gen expansion updates for previous gen systems so like for example ubisoft is actually pretty good at this they release you know 4k 60 fps patches for like all the uh eighth gen uh assassin's creed games and far cry games so now far cry 5 it's five years old they gave it a 4k 60 fps update i don't think they included any new dlc but in some cases they might have um i guess the way i would answer this question uh, on the surface without deeper diving into it is if it's an online dependent game if the game is popular i would say minimum 10 years if it's popular if it's not popular that opens a different can of worms maybe five years and if the game's a complete dud i guess you can't expect any real support single player games 
I treat more as a bonus. You know, if if a game comes out and the developer considers it essentially done, uh, then I am good with that. Anything after that is nice. Like, I played Far Cry 5 all the way through. I didn't need it to run in 4K at 60 FPS. I enjoyed my experience. Granted, I didn't know any better because the option didn't exist at the time. But when they're like, oh, here's a big update that makes it even more current gen, that's cool. I didn't require it. It was free. That's great. I don't have to do anything special to run it. Um, but the argument of, you know, should it, they have just waited and done, you know, like uh, new DLC or should they have released a collector's edition with like the, all the patches, that happens too. You know, like uh, Skyrim for example, like that was obviously a, a seventh gen game and they have re-released it multiple times now with all the patches and all the DLC on disc. I think they even just did some new DLC like a year or two ago. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, so there are exceptions in there. I don't know if there's any like general rule to it. What do you guys think? Yeah, I know that right now there's like no general rule to it or anything. And I also wasn't really thinking about, like, ports to newer systems as counting in this. I was thinking more just, like, the one original version of the game. And what actually made me start thinking about this were, would be games like Stellaris and Civ Six, which, um, less so Civ Six, but those games have been getting updates for, like, years. Like, Stellaris first came out in 2016. Um, and... If you were to play the game then and then play the game now, you'd have no idea they were the same game. Now, obviously, I got into Solaris relatively late, but what Paradox does generally is, like, they do a couple of patches every year, a couple of DLC packs, but when they do their patches, like, one of, like with one of their major DLCs, the most recent one, well, second most recent one, the major one, the Overlord update, completely reworked how, like, the vassalization system works where you basically become the overlord of the, another empire. Like, it completely changed that. Um, that up, oh, and actually, now there's a more up further one, like First Contact, they completely changed how you interact with pre spacefaring civilizations. And, like, it, in the original game, like, it, things were, like, completely different. Like, they had a completely different, like, way you had, you got to different systems. I was starting to, and I was seeing, like, on Reddit and stuff like that, that there were a couple of people who were mentioning, who were asking, so when are we going to get Solaris 2? And other people were like, we basically already have it. Like, the the game now, is with all the updates, are completely different, and that's kind of what spurred on my thought process, because, yeah, I mean, Solaris is a completely different game now than it was even, like, two years ago. So it's like... So to reframe it then the question is more at what point does the game cease to be its own game and become the sequel it never officially became basically like when that or when they should like should they have at some point decided okay now we need to actually like make a sequel because i mean the game is the game does feel completely different nowadays but it's still running on the same engine that existed since 2016 and stuff like that That's it's kind of an interesting philosophical question, honestly, because it's yeah. uh, there's not too many games where that's going to be the case because it does require that there's sufficient funding, sufficient popularity, sufficient interest for it to keep going. But also that's a thing where you can see that that was never the plan, most likely. It just kind of got away from them. Uh, like, um, well, no Man's Sky. This is actually Paradox's like general business model nowadays. Like, support that's the same game with a lot of DLC for, like, a while and then basically do a sequel when they kind of have to because the engine just can't support any more changes like i'm pretty sure that if crusader kings 2 was wasn't going to become an unstable mess if they added anything more to it we wouldn't have gotten crusader kings 3 but i'll defer to you on that one i was kind of referring to more to things like no man's sky where it's oh, kind of right, a totally yeah. different game than it was originally but that clearly wasn't the plan to to do that at least not publicly anyway yeah. um do you you know do you eventually morph your game into its own sequel uh which is i guess kind of what happened with overwatch um but yeah that that's that's interesting I, there's just i don't think there's too many cases for that but also 
if you look at it from their perspective, the argument might be like, well, look, we're saving you money on stuff because you don't have to buy anything new. They also kind of have the established marketing and built in base of the game already existing. And you just kind of get that uh, frog in a boiling, uh, not a boiling pot of water that you slowly, you know, you know, heat up and they never really notice type of logic um, as opposed to jump throwing them into boiling water to begin with. Yeah, I, there's the thing with that is that model only works for games that are usually online persistent, um, or at least need a connection for the updates in the first place. But then again, like I said at the beginning of this, we're kind of older guys, and I think we're all kind of slightly more used to a traditional model of a game being done. So ask someone from Gen Z. Yeah. Like, and I, I'm going to also be clear here. I'm glad Solaris keeps getting DLC. I mean, I'm, I've spent, like over like 1500 hours in that game and i would not have done that if it wasn't getting updates and same with same with civ 6 they just finished an another round of dlc just now this was actually free for anyone who bought all the previous dlc which added new leaders and stuff though in civ 6 cases that was very clearly more let's let the junior team like just do some minor updates while the main team's actually working on civ 7 so it's not Quite the same. Well, quote, Civ 7. We don't actually know if, the, if their next game is Civ 7, but we do know that they are they are working on a new game. Civ 6 is basically done at this point, but Solaris seems like it's going to just keep going and going until the game will actually... until the game actually can't add anything new to it without literally breaking in half. So... <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give kind of an unsatisfactory, like, on-the-fence response to this, because... On the one hand, I actually think this is cool. Like, you know, if you already spent your money, you've already got this game you like, it's kind of awesome that it just kind of keeps getting supported and you keep getting access to it, especially when the updates are free and all that. But on the same side of things, I said that classic guy in me is like, what if I wanted to go back and play that original version of the game and it simply doesn't exist anymore? You know, like, which is actually better? You know, is it better to have that game locked up and then get the sequel that I have to spend money on, but I get the new experience? Or was it better to not spend the money and I can have all the experiences, but one of them is just in my memory now? In the case of Stellaris specifically, at least for the PC version, I'm pretty sure you can't do this on the console versions, which are actually behind a couple of updates. Um, if you go to their forums and get a code that you can put into the Steam into Steam, they actually let you go back and choose any, like, major patch version that you want to play. You can go back and play Solaris 1.0 if you wanted to. But that's... Okay, a, that's good then. Solaris or a Paradox-specific thing. Okay, so that's just that game. It's not as a concept. Okay, well, that's, that's good. At least there's exceptions in some cases. Yeah. Rob, what do you think? Yeah, so uh, another exception in that case would probably be... Now, I don't play this, but as far as I know, um, probably one of the best models of this, you know, uh, games-as-a-service mentality where developers continually uh, support the same game through, like, updates and DLC is World of Warcraft. And um, I think a few years ago they released, like, World of Warcraft Classic which is like the original build of the game. So without any of the, you know, what, two dozen DLCs that, that the game has had. And, that, you know, that game's still being supported, even though it's like archaic uh, game engine and graphics and everything compared to today. Um, and people still get joy and use out of it. So, the, I, you know, I think to, uh, to Adam's point, if a game is popular and successful enough, keep supporting it, you know. Um, my, uh, my two cases, um, that, uh, to focus on uh, is one is a single player. The other is multiplayer. The single player game that I would point to that we have not gotten a sequel to, even though a lot of people have requested it, um, in favor of, uh, releasing DLC and new modes and continuing to support it is Mario Kart 8. Uh, originally a Wii U game that was released in 2014, I believe. It's insane to think this game is eight, nine years old at this point. And it's still getting DLC. It got that the the deluxe version on the Switch when it came out in 2017. And then uh, they have continually supported it through patches, through updates, and now they have the expansion pass 
where you get what 48 new courses you know to a game that everybody loves because i mean where do you go from there mario kart 8 is i think objectively thought of by a lot of people as like the pinnacle of the series so you just keep iterating on that that ultimate form of the, the game instead of making a mario kart 9 or uh super smash kart you know and uh, mm. may, opening it up to other nintendo franchises um yeah i mean that and that game is extremely successful even to this day it's like i i was just playing it yesterday with my wife we had a day off and we're like oh let's check out the new dlc courses and it's great i love the fact that that game is still getting um dlc at this point because i think it's sold like one of the best selling games on the switch easily um the best selling mario kart game of all time by by country mile um it's also so the yeah. best selling wii u game but that's not surprising oh yeah well of course well, the, yeah. Wii, the, the attach rate of the Wii U version was like 50% of people that owned a Wii U had that game. Like, it was something yeah. insane well, like that. With how, with how few people bought Wii U's, like, the only people who really got them were, like, hardcore Nintendo fans. So that makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. The, uh, the Wii U version sold 8.46 million... The copies and that's and, that's pretty high because there was only 13 million we sold yeah, we used sold and, but so uh, overall go. the game is sold over 60 million units um so it's like yeah damn right we're still going to be giving this game dlc because people still buy it yeah but anytime i also you... think in that specific case that nintendo might not bother with a, a mario kart 9 until there's a new system anyway i think that it fair, seems like yeah. a, it's it seems like a very good launch title for yeah. whatever the next thing is but that's years away anyway sorry but uh the the other game that i wanted to focus on is one of my favorite games uh online you know uh, specific games as a service title is sea of thieves on um, the xbox and pc uh this was is a microsoft game made by rare and it's a the pirate adventure game really really fun game uh that came out in 2017 I'm sorry, 2018, rather, on the Xbox One uh, series of consoles. And has since been ported to PC. It's been ported. Um, there's an Xbox Series X version. It's on Steam now. So there's lots of ways to play this game. Now, this game, when it came out, was was harshly criticized for being as, wi uh, as wide as an ocean but deep as a puddle where there was this amazing world in this giant map, but so few things to actually do in the game. And the developers have been so good at, over the course of these five years now that it, this game has been out, continuously updating the sandbox to give players more options to expand the game and have more fun in its world as well as incorporating new missions, time-limited events, um, massive single-player, or not single-player, story-driven, I would say, content, like The Pirate's Life, where they introduced a uh, Pirates of the Caribbean crossover in the game with Disney. Um, and the game's population and popularity has skyrocketed during this time. Um, when people are realizing, wow, this game is continuing to be supported almost every month with new content. Um, it's got a massive player base, it, and you can, while you cannot go back to the original Sea of Thieves, you know, Sea of Thieves classic, as it were, um, the same, that same sandbox is there. You could still have those same adventures that you could have on day one now. Um, you just have more things to do um in the game um but to go back to your original question of when should a game stop being supported and be given a sequel instead um one of the criticisms of sea of thieves is that because this game was originally intended to run on the xbox one consoles the base model vcr xbox one um and now it's running on Xbox Series X and high-end gaming PCs through Steam. The game is struggling to keep up. The engine can't handle, in some of these cases, a lot of these 
um, expansions uh, to the sandbox, all these story things where the servers sometimes start to chug or um, you get error codes. There's a lot of glitches whenever a new update um, is introduced because it's not optimized um, to run on those older consoles anymore. Now I'm running it on an Xbox Series X at 4K, 60 frames per second, and it, it handles it no problem. But you could see that it's like there's some limitations of how far they could change this game and evolve this game in a meaningful way because they still have to make it run on an Xbox One base model. So eventually you have to like look at this and say, okay, if this game continues to be successful seven, eight years down the line after its launch, you know, do we cut loose that 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 segment of the player base still playing on base model Xbox Ones in favor of people that are playing on next gen hardware or on high end gaming PCs to keep up? So that is my thought of really when should a game like really seriously be thought of as needing a sequel as opposed to a live service continuing to update the game because the the classic model is when destiny came out um i think that was uh xbox it was originally on the xbox 360 and ps3 um and bungie said that the, we have a 10-year plan for this game this game's going to be around for 10 years and i think it made it what like three years before destiny 2 came out because they were struggling to have it run on uh, uh, the original hardware that it was co-developed for. So who knows? Um, I mean, all I know is that it's like I do enjoy this game. And if it did stop getting updates, like I would, I would be disappointed. And I think a lot of the charm of that game is in the fact of that you don't know what's on the horizon what's going to be this next thing that we're going to be introduced to you can have fun in the sandbox absolutely but you're going to lose a large chunk of that player base by taking away those in incremental updates as i said before you know if it's an online dependent game you should probably get about 10 years i think if it's a good or successful game if it's a single player game even though that's what I play and I love the idea that I'm getting these random, you know, 4K, 60 FPS, free L free DLC updates years later, I'm going to be honest, I don't expect them. I just expect the game to be functional when it's released, which is, of course, these days a joke. It never happens. But once they get it to the point where they consider it done, I'm usually okay with that. Anything after that, that is just gravy. It's just bonus. It's nice. Like I said, Ubisoft giving out these free updates. Microsoft does it too. I think that's cool. Or even, you know, when they were doing some of these updates for, like, emulated stuff, like 360 titles, they suddenly gave 4K patches to. Great bonus. Love that they did that. Don't require it. But it's cool. Um, how long would I expect something like that to happen? Maybe five years tops, but usually only because of, like, five-year anniversaries. Not really any other reason. But to be fair, again, Ubisoft's been doing that with games that are far older than that. So... You know, it's it's kind of interesting because, like, it's obviously been happening for a while, but it also feels like a relatively new concept because you used to not be able to even have that possibility technologically. So I guess it's cool, but then there's that old part of me that's like, well, can't you, like, give me Far Cry 5 4K 60 FPS all DLC edition on a disc? And the answer is no, they're not going to do that. But, yeah, right. Yeah. So we will move on to the next subject. Joseph, thank you very much for picking that. The next subject is by Spencer Per Year. Uh, so shout out to him. He uh, actually had like kind of a philosophical question, which I guess kind of ties with what we were just talking about a little bit. It's a, it's basically a collecting opinion question. So he specifically wanted us to discuss the idea that if you buy a game, you know, like you bought a disc, you bought a, a cartridge, whatever it is, you bought it complete, whatever that context is, if you replace the case or replace the manual, replace the disc, replace the cartridge, whatever it is, of that particular copy of the game you have, is it no longer original or complete? It's kind of a ship of Theseus philosophy question. At what point is it no longer the same game you had? Or is it always the same one? Like, where do, where do you draw that line philosophically? Um, while you guys think about that for a second, I guess I will kind of say my piece. 
I would argue that unless it had some sort of deep childhood meaning to you, like, you know, your mother gave you this specific copy or this was like the one you grew up on or whatever. In general, I am typically okay with like, if for some reason, you know, like I have a game and like, you know, let's say I had a Wii U game and the case was cracked and I, I got a donor case from some junk game and put a nice one on there. That's fine. I, to me, that's still original. Uh, the same would go for the manual or the disc. You, you'll go for the nicest version. You upgrade it again. In my personal philosophy, the only time it ceases to be what it ever was was in the unique circumstance in which that particular copy meant something to you for reasons outside of it just being a game but uh that's me what do you guys think um yeah i kind of feel the same way with the added caveat that if there was like something special about like an addition to the game and then you replace the part of it and it wasn't with another basically if like say if you if the case was different because it was like a special edition and then you replaced it with like just the normal case or whatever then obviously it's not the complete special edition anymore for whatever reason but like other than that i mean if if the parts are all like interchangeable and are exactly basically the same except for like condition and it's still a complete copy of the game even if the parts came from different physical copies so like if you rounded up all the individual pieces and threw it together it's it is now a complete copy yeah yeah, I, I would agree with that. I actually did that with my copy of um, Burning Rangers for the Sega Saturn. I have the North American version of that. And that was a total, like, compile it type of thing. I found... So there's a very old episode of Playload that exists in which uh, I show you guys the disc originally because there was a guy who reached out to me and said, like, hey, I've got Burning Rangers. I'm willing to sell it to you. Like, disc only. It was, like, 70 bucks, And I was like... Eh, at the time and I was like alright fine I'll, I'll do it and I bought just the disc and that's what I had for a while I eventually found a guy on eBay who was selling just the manual you know for like 15 bucks and then a guy was selling just the back inlay for like 20 bucks or whatever it was so then I had all the pieces I just needed the physical cases so then you just buy like a sports game and then all of a sudden you're like oh wow look at this I have a complete copy of Burning Rangers which is like a multi hundred dollar game now and I did it for way less granted different era but were, were all those originally together? No. But you, but it is now combined. Its powers together like a Megazord merged into a complete thing. Um, one other argument, though, I could understand about maybe it not being complete anymore is I used to do this. So, like, uh, I would replace like Dreamcast or PS1 games, like I would replace the cases. Like if the cases got cracked, you know, I'd replace it with like a new one that was nice. The problem is that when you like buy those blank empty cases, often they're not of the same grade of quality as like, you know, something Sega or Sony put out. So then you kind of can tell that they're bad. So that was where I was like, well, should I be doing this or not? Is it no longer complete? Because you're now putting like generically produced ones as opposed to the originals. And in some cases, I think I tolerated tolerated it and others I didn't. So that's I could see that being a legitimate case of it's technically no longer complete because it's not the one that Sega or Sony produced. But at the same time, to anybody who's casual about it, you wouldn't really notice because it performs the same function. It's just the plastic is technically a little bit weaker, but it also is more aesthetically pleasing. Um, so that's like an individual case by case basis. Now I would argue the same logic. If you took like, all right, so you remember PS2 games had very specific cases. They say Sony all over them. They have a memory card slot. If you were to replace that with a generic DVD case, I would argue it's no longer complete, even though you have all the elements. Oh yeah, no, it would don't... have to be like a legit like PS2 case that you were precisely, with. precisely. But there's uh, a, the but same. There's also in in regards to the PS2 specifically two variants. There's one. The early ones have memory card slots. The later ones do not. So like, would you find out which? box the originally came with did you know was it an earlier release with a memory card slot or did it just have the sony logo up on the top so ah see that's a very good go question that? see that's a very good question um i guess in most cases you'd either have to do your homework or just be good enough with the ignorance of which one it was or wasn't yeah. uh personally i've never gone down that rabbit hole because i don't really 
buy ones that are in DVD cases. Um, actually, funny, I back in the day, and this date me quite substantially, I used to have a buddy who worked at a Blockbuster, and he was like, it was their policy that they had to replace all the uh, game cases with generic Blockbuster cases. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so he's like, we would just, in mass, just throw away PlayStation 2, Xbox, GameCube cases. So he used to just keep them and just give them to me in stacks. So I had, like, extras. So, like, when you would go to GameStop and buy, like, a used PS2 game or whatever from them, you would I would have a good, ready-to-go PS2 case that I could put it all together on. So I was always kind of doing this. Um, but I will admit freely, like, when I look at my Xbox collection, I will notice there's, like, 360 cases mixed in to some of the OG cases, which they shouldn't be there. And I tolerate it. Um, but... Yeah, for the most part, I I try to keep it as original as possible. But I won't lie, it does kind of irk me that even though it's like it's complete, it's sort of not. But I've never been bothered by the fact that like this particular plastic case was the one that came with this copy and I'm now replacing it with another one unless there's something special about it. And as dumb as it is, the one time I can think of that being the case is a lot of the sports games We'll put stickers on them that say like you know uh, this is an officially licensed NHL yeah. product or whatever. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, and I'm like, crap! You got to keep that. You can't change that one. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But I stuff t- like that. Yeah, I tried to buy a sports game for the GameCube to basically give my copy of Melee an actual case because when I bought it off eBay, they put it in a PS2 case for some reason. Um, but. Then I saw that sticker and I was like, well, crap, I can't do that. And then I never actually got around to doing that. But, yeah, you would. I, I would say that if you're going to be assembling it from pieces, in order for it to be really considered complete, um, you probably need to get the exact version of the case it came in, in the case of the PS2. So... Uh, for my philosophy on this, like, I'm generally in line with you guys. Like, I don't care if the manual and the sleeve is from, uh, you know, from a different copy of the game, as long as it's complete. You know, I've got the manual, I've got the case, and I've got the disc. That's good. The only time that I could consider maybe being a little bit more snobbish is in the rare case where, um, if you're collecting boxed systems or handhelds, sometimes there would be a serial number on the box, and like I maybe in a uh, you know perfect world you'd want the serial number for the console to match the one on the box. Yes, there are like box codes in game cart serial numbers for stuff like DS games, but nobody really looks at that. But for the consoles, man, yeah, maybe. But I mean, I know for most most cases, especially in like that, um, you know, sixth gen, seventh gen, when you know I was working at video game stores and you had to scan the serial number when you were selling a console. Most of the time, the boxes just had a hole in it where you would scan through to the serial number on the console itself. So um, maybe that, but that would be a very big stretch, you know, if there was a serial number on the box and the serial number with the console. All right, I'm going to ask you both a follow-up to this. Um, how do you feel about things like ads or registration cards that are in the packaging? Needed or not? Nice to have, but not necessary. Yeah, same here. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how many of those I've thrown away. Like, I don't care. Like, one of them comes with, like, an ad for, like, a McDonald's cheeseburger. I'm like, I don't need this. Like, <laughs> this is just junk. The, the, but then it's like... The, the, the difference is that if there was, like, on a say a Japanese Sega Saturn game, you know, they have spine cards, you know, those little cardboard. Yeah, the labels. Obis, Obis. And labels. Those have to be They're called there. They're called or, Obis. Or something like uh, a DLC code for something. Even if the code's spent, I'd kind of like to have that in there. Or a, a soundtrack, you know, Silent Hill 3, my copy of that game, has the manual, it has the disc, it has the original box, but it's missing the soundtrack. I'm like, oh shit, is that complete? Uh, probably not. Am I? I okay didn't realize with it? that Silent Hill Three came with a soundtrack. Yeah, um, or like a demo disc. You know, sometimes uh, you know a game would come with uh, like a demo. I know that was commonplace on the uh, on the PS One a lot. Um, and uh, or like you know my copy of uh, Magic Knight Ray Earth on the Sega Saturn. Like it has to have the stickers. 
you know, in there, or it has to, uh, you know, um, it has to have everything that was going to come with that original game, you know, that you don't, you don't want to cut out of the center of the, uh, the manual or something like that. That, that would be my, my idiosyncrasies for that. Right. I think that's perfectly reasonable. Yeah. Um, I was trying to think if there's any other, like, cause it's like the registration cards, maybe, you know, you kind of keep those, but like, I always kind of consider they're optional, but it is funny. You're right. As time goes on. It's, you know, you look back and you're, you know, maybe you're in Japan or whatever and you open up a game case. If it has the registration card, you start to see it as a bonus. You're yeah. like, oh, wow, cool. But, like, when you were actually opening it originally, yeah, this is just some crap. It's 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 weird how that happens. Uh, maybe because it's just time capsule stuff. But, yeah. I, it, it, I, it's also a lot easier nowadays because games don't come with anything. They don't come with anything. Yeah, I know, right? You actually, know. I'm going to say this. The 360 pisses me off for that reason because... Towards the end of the 360 in particular, it was a complete crapshoot which ones were going to have manuals and not. Yeah. Uh, the same with the Wii U, actually. Like, it just kind of became like, is it complete or not? You legit had no idea. And we got into the unboxing era. Thank God for all the YouTubers that were just doing individual unboxing of <laughs> random games. So you could actually see, like, oh, okay, yeah. that game. I can't tell you how many times I was at a store or a con, or something like that, and I found the game I wanted. It had no manual, and I was like, well, is it because it's missing, or because it doesn't exist? And I would go and find a video on YouTube of somebody opening it brand new and be like, ah, it doesn't exist, or ah, it does exist. It's like, I hate that we're in that, but now I guess we're kind of at the point where we're really not anymore. There's typically nothing in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when, when I'm working at Digital Press, and we are selling something like a complete box copy of a game or a, a console it's like i yeah i will actually look on like ebay listings i will look for unboxing videos because we've got a whole like aisle of boxes there um with like spare manuals or spare registration cards or like little advertisements posters and things that came with the consoles so it's like yeah i will look at unboxings of things so if we if something is missing it's like oh maybe i'll check downstairs to see if we have that and so I am contributing to the ship of Theseus problem, um, but uh, that's fine as long as it's, it's eventually restored. Yeah, if it's restored, yeah. I mean that's better than the, just a pile of incomplete stuff. Yeah. So, all right. Well, I, I think that we've set our piece on that. So thank you very much, Spencer, for the subject. Looking forward to the next one you come up with. Um, and also, Joseph, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we've been very efficient today. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we will, we're will. we going to move on now to a round of shout-outs. Now, the following people are all Patreon backers, and they're at the tier in which they get a shout-out. We've got Luis Bonilla, Loke, Michael Kelly, Tim Inman, and Trey Wagner. Once again, that is Luis Bonilla, Loke, Michael Kelly, Tim Inman, Trey Wagner. Thank you very much for your support. We could not do this without you, and you help keep the lights on for the channel. Very much appreciated. And that, of course, goes out to you as well, Joseph. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And we're back. We are now joined by Abdullah. Welcome back, dude. Hello, hi, happy to be back. Thank you for joining us again. And I know we missed you, Matt, last month, and you know it's been kind of busy for you, but we're, we're glad to have you back. Um, so, thank you, thank you. Yeah, no problem. So you didn't have a subject, so we, we decided to fill one in for you, but then we kind of stole a subject from someone else. So there, Chuck Shaw is a Patreon backer. He gets to pick a subject. But I thought his subject would be good to give to you, and then a subject I came up with will be given to Chuck. Chuck, if you're out there, I'm sorry, but you're going to get your subject. It's just... It's going to be here and now with Abdullah first because, you know, he's actually on the show. So, uh, but everybody wins. Okay, so here's what I wanted to talk about. And I know, Rob, you were kind of interested in this too. I'm assuming, Abdullah, that you did read about this, that Xbox is shutting down the emulation services uh, uh, specifically for Nintendo content. Have you heard about that? Yes, I have heard about it, but I haven't read a lot about it. But when you reminded me of it, I decided to read a bit more. So, Rob, why don't you take point and explain to everybody? So, when the Xbox uh, Series S and X came out, um, the the community soon realized that there's actually this really cool uh, mode that you can purchase, I think for like $20, and enable permanently on your console called Developer Mode. And this Developer Mode basically unlocks your console for... Uh, app development, some game development, uh, tinkering with it as you would, uh, you know, a gaming PC. But also, you could install 
various emulators, specifically like um, RetroArch and um, DuckStation. So these, they found out that the Xbox uh, consoles are fantastic at running emulation uh, modules for older systems all the way up to like PlayStation 2 and 3. Um, so basically if you if it exists, the Xbox can run it um, in an emulator, which people are like, wow, suddenly that Xbox Series S, right? You know, $250 console, uh, $250 console you can get, you know, um, you can get some Game Pass for it and then install like RetroArch on it. And then like, holy crap, you got like this really all in one badass little, you know, digital console. So people were really using these uh, modern systems for emulator purposes um, until uh, this week where Microsoft has shut down um, classic retro game emulation on the uh, on the Xbox consoles. So one would assume that Sony and or Nintendo approached Microsoft and said that, hey, uh, we do not like the fact that uh, you are so easily allowing piracy um, on your consoles of our, you know, intellectual property, um, maybe make it a little bit harder. So if you log on to the RetroArch uh, emulator, for instance, um, you will get, like, greeted with a error message uh, saying that it violates uh, Microsoft's uh, policies. So I, I believe that you might still be able to use it in developer mode, since you can yes yeah but in the the front end like standard console mode that that everybody has on there no longer even if you have it installed via developer mode access those emulators so score one for the big corporations i guess <laughs> i guess so i have a, i have kind of a lot of philosophical thoughts on this um, first of all, let's talk a little bit of history. Like, why does this mode even exist? It actually has to do with the fact that Microsoft's policy towards piracy has really evolved. Um, you remember the original Xbox and how it was, like, famously super easy to modify it and everybody built, like, these, yeah. you know, ultimate Xboxes and whatever? So that was a huge embarrassment for them. So with the 360, they decided to really amp that up. But people still figured out ways to get around it. Like, even extreme ones, like, there's a version where you have to, like, drill a hole through your motherboard, but then it unlocks it. And that's why modded Xbox 360s are such a pain. With the Xbox One and the Series X, their philosophy was like, look... We can't, we really can't stop people from trying to do this. All we can do is demotivate them and make it not really worth the effort. So that's why you get such a string of constant updates for number one, because, you know, it can take forever to figure out how to decrypt, uh, you know, a specific software update. But then they update it so regularly that it's just, you know, takes an eternity to, you know, it's just not worth the effort. But on top of that, by demotivating people, that was part of the logic behind Game Pass. Like, if you can just pay a couple bucks a month and essentially get all that stuff almost for free anyway, then you don't really care. Developer mode, or this this thing specifically, was also another attempt to do that. Like, look, give us 20 bucks and you're done. You don't have to try and pirate our console. You can have all these emulators running all you want. Let's keep it real. That was Microsoft's logic behind this, because they weren't technically doing anything illegal they were letting you decide if you were going to do something illegal or not they didn't have anything to do with it but they also prevented a whole bunch of people from caring about trying to modify their hardware and i still believe that at their heart that's all they care about i don't think they give a rat's behind about uh you know sony's intellectual property or nintendo's intellectual property but and i purely speculate on this i purely speculate on it I think that they, in particular, want a better relationship with Nintendo, which is kind of where the whole Golden Ideal came out of. I think that they would like some sort of working relationship with them, and I also think that they want their support, and again, I completely am just speculating, that this is also a side effect of the Activision acquisition. Yeah. So they're having a lot of problems 
trying to complete that. Uh, Sony especially is fighting them on it. So if they went to Nintendo and were like, look, we'll give you Call of Duty for 10 years, which you've never even had Call of Duty since like the Wii U. I don't think there's been a version. I could be wrong, but I don't even think there yeah, is a that's, Call of Duty game true. on the Switch. Um, I think that they're basically trying to buy Nintendo's support. So that would explain why GoldenEye was such weak sauce. It, it, it was basically just a, an N64 emulated version running for the Switch that was then poorly converted to the Xbox. Um, it would also explain why they're offering them this great deal for Call of Duty when they've never even had it. Um, they want to win them over. I would almost guarantee you this happened because Nintendo went to them and like, you got to put a stop to that right now, otherwise we are not on good terms. And Microsoft likely caved to it because they need them in their court saying this is not a monopoly, it's fine if Activision is with Microsoft. Uh, to a lesser extent, that might appeal to Sony, but I don't, I don't really think that that's why they did it. That would be my guess behind all of this. And it's it's a little... It, it is something I always say, I've been saying in videos forever. Like, you don't really own the modern stuff. Um, because this, is, this would be the advantage of hacking the console rather than quote-unquote doing it legitimately. Because if it's done legitimately, they have every right to take it from you as they just did from everybody. Whereas a hacked console, they can't do anything about um, you know, I, I did a whole video when the, the, remember the PS5, like, um, CMOS bomb thing? Yeah. yeah. And, like, the issue there was basically eventually with time, provided it wasn't corrected, which to the Sony's credit, they, they largely fixed. Every iteration of the PlayStation hardware, with the exception of the PS1, because of online dependencies, is technically limited, even after being hacked. Uh, you know, even the PS2 has content that's inaccessible after a certain point and no longer functions properly. Uh, it, it's just kind of that's the world we're going into. And this is proof in the pudding right here, which is you thought you bought something. You thought you then had the right to do whatever you wanted with the thing you bought. But a guy with a switch somewhere like a physical switch, not a Nintendo switch or maybe a Nintendo switch as well. Just straight up said, no, click off, and now none of that works anymore. You didn't really buy anything. You didn't really have the right to it. Remember that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's frustrating. Like, I get why you know, Microsoft would want to improve their relations with other you know console manufacturers, specifically Nintendo and Sony. Um, and, like, I do appreciate that at least for now, as as of the recording of this, like you still can access these things through developer mode, um, but uh, this is kind of indicative of a reversal of attitude that Microsoft has been really having in being a very consumer friendly uh, company, really for the past, I would say four or five years, um, in that because of their lagging sales numbers in the face of the Switch and the PS4, um, that they were developing things like Game Pass and attitudes towards um, towards gaming and gaming preservation and making their consoles uh, very, very friendly to various enterprises, you could say. Um, and that really to try and rebuild a lot of the consumer trust in their company and this uh you know this developer mode being able to run retro arcs was um was fantastic for a lot of people they're like wow this is this really shows that the potential that the xbox consoles have but now you start to roll it back in the face of corporate pressure uh the want to get uh you know that merger deal um you know, finalized and to kind of have corporate synergy between the three big pillars of video games. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate, but I understand where they're coming from. Like make, make no mind, you know, and granted emulating is not illegal. Oh, like the emulators themselves are not only illegal, what you use them for in pirated ISOs and ROMs, that's what's illegal. So to, to, to just to clarify that, Yes, but that is the United States. That does not apply in every country. True, and it also does not apply it under certain rules, um, like 
uh, a storefront. So Microsoft's ecosystem says, no, you are not allowed to emulate other consoles um, under our ecosystem. Like, yes, it's cool that you were able to kind of figure this out, but it is against our terms of service. Exactly. Abdullah, what say you? Well, uh, okay, so uh, like you said, uh, both of you, uh, that I can see the point of them doing that, and it makes sense on why they did that, uh, due to relations and maybe due to the due to the concept of emulation itself. Because uh, I was discussing the con- uh, emulation with uh, uh, my friend, uh, the game shop owner. So I was telling him, uh, is it like it's like a, it's a double-edged sword, if you, in a basic sense, because on the one hand, consumers will be happy that they can pretty much get many things for for as low as possible and even for free at the same time uh they would uh at the same time the companies would lose money so so it's really a double-edged sword here it has to be balanced so as you all said i agree that i do see the point in them doing that but why now not before it being linked to nintendo only would make a lot of sense because they have a history I mean, I, Nintendo would shut down even fan games. I play Nintendo mostly. Uh, 90% of what I play, maybe 95% of what I play is Nintendo, right? And I, I, I love their games. I love every, everything that they're doing in this context. But this specific part of them being super protective eventually hits them in the long run. And now that they're even affecting, they're not just going in the region that they are in, their company, their their stuff, they're also going through other means that people are trying to get. And so we're going to reach from there. Well, I mean, that's that's just Nintendo. They're very protective of their intellectual property. I mean, yeah. I personally, you know, honestly, dude, it would not surprise me, given how weird Nintendo is as a company, that they were simply unaware that you could even do this on a Series X until recently. Um, yeah, so when they then- did... They started yeah. all this. Well, once they were aware of it, the only reason Nintendo or Microsoft would comply with this, in my opinion, is if there was some sort of, let's call it political leverage. I don't think there was any legal leverage because Microsoft is not sitting there saying, hey, here's a bunch of NES games that we downloaded and illegally and you can do whatever you want with. People are choosing to do that independently. They're just giving you software that makes it possible for you to do other things, which is completely legal, again, within the United States specifically when I say that. Political leverage would be like pressure, pressure on them to, you know, like change it because if you want our support for something you're going to have to do it scratch my back i'll scratch yours type of logic but again that's speculation on my part for all i know you know somebody who's over at nintendo just found out this was a thing called their buddy at microsoft and was like yo guys come on what the fuck you got to change this and they're like oh yeah all right if it means something to you and then like it was that simple i have no idea i doubt it but it's not impossible. At the end of the day, these are these are decisions made by just individual people. So we can only speculate on what their motivations were. Um, corporations are not entities, you know. So it's they're not individ- They're not motivated by that. But the truth is, we don't know. All we can do is speculate. My speculative reasoning behind this was just wanting Nintendo's further cooperation with the Activision deal. And perhaps greasing the wheels for other sorts of things, but we don't know what those things are yet. Yeah, and I think they they they're never going to mention if it's due to Nintendo or not because that's not within the scope of such things. They're just going to take the action, and they have officially announced it as just uh, oh, it's according to policy, whatever we can do that. Uh, but they didn't specify Nintendo, but the community will, is well aware that if it is, if there is a cause, then it's probably like 80% Nintendo, I'm guessing. Probably. I mean, the policy is also something they can update on a whim. So as soon as they update it, it violates their policy. It's it's whatever. Rob, are you intending to try this in the dev mode or whatever? I, I had the intention of messing around with it, but it's like, I, I, I really didn't see the need to. I have, you know, I... I don't know. I, I have most of the games that I really want to play retro wise in their original forms. You know, I might have messed around with it out of morbid curiosity, but I, I wouldn't have, you know, really gone in deep on this. 
Okay. All right. Uh, then I guess that's good for now. Abdullah, thank you for that subject, even though technically Chuck picked it, but I think it works <laughs> well. <laughs> um, now we're going to get on to the one that Chuck didn't pick that we're going to credit to him. Uh, so I saw this story the other day. This actually came out on April Fool's uh, on April 1st. So I thought it was a joke, but they were very serious that it's not. And it's actually something you can look for online. Um, I don't know if either of you have heard of a game called Xeno Crisis. Have you? Yes, I have it on the Neo Geo CD. Okay. Abdullah, have you heard of it? Heard of it. Never played it. Okay. So Xeno Crisis, as, as Rob just said, is a game. It does exist on Neo Geo CD. It actually originally was a Sega Genesis game uh, uh, that was backed on Kickstarter. Actually, fun fact, I'm an NPC in that. You can, like, rescue me and stuff because I backed it on Kickstarter. Um, they This is a game that is odd because it's I think it's Bitmap Bureau is the company that makes it. Yeah. And they've released it on a ton of platforms. Like, the first thing that came out was the Genesis. They did a Dreamcast version, which I did a video on. They also did, as you just said, a Neo Geo CD version. It's also, by the way, just fun fact, it's cool that the Neo Geo CD suddenly has this, like, somewhat booming independent scene. I think that's neat. But what surprised everybody on April 1st, they announced it was getting two new versions. One was the Nintendo 64, which is not technically the first indie N64 release, but it it might be like the first one that was actually completely developed separately. Like we've had a lot of like ROM, ROM hacks, hack yeah. carts and we had some like, you know, source code dumps like... Um, what was the game? 40 Winks, which was made for the N64 but never released, got an official yeah. release later where they kind of finished it up and dumped it and everything. I, I supported that. I think this is the first truly independent game actually released for the N64, which is kind of fascinating. But the one that really surprised me, because I know we were there with cartridges, like you see people tinkering with N64 stuff, is Xeno Crisis is now set to be the first GameCube independent release. Um, which I was like shocked that they, they were doing that. Um, now in reading about it, it's, you have to understand one of the reasons if you're out there and you're like, how come some systems get new games like this and a bunch don't like, how come I can have this on a Dreamcast, but I can't have this on a PS2 or whatever. Um, part of it has to do with the complications of developing for those systems. PS2 is famously difficult to develop for. But the other part of it is the distribution method. The Dreamcast is capable of reading unsigned code. Thus, you can develop the game independently. You can publish it independently. Sega doesn't really care what you do. And it will run on every, pretty much every Dreamcast that was ever released. You don't have to do anything special. PS2, on the other hand, that's not the case. You'd have to have a hacked PS2, and most likely these days you would only do it digitally anyway through like the SSD mods or whatever that people have done, which I've done videos on as well. GameCube was an interesting one because GameCube is a system that absolutely does not read unsigned code. Uh, but they are releasing a press disc, and I read through it, and it straight up says, like, this will not work in most GameCubes. You have to have a GameCube with a mod chip in it, like the Viper mod chip or whatever. Um, so that it can read burned discs, essentially, even though the disc itself is pressed, it doesn't contain the original Nintendo wobble in it to, to make it legitimate. So Rob, you're the huge GameCube fan. What, what do you think of this? Uh, well, you just told me about this last night when, <laughs> when you, uh, gave me the subject list and, uh, I went out, uh, I think two seconds after you, uh, sent me that message and bought a copy. <laughs> right, so, that's what i figured <laughs> okay that says a lot <laughs> so because um, you know i am a game you guy in the same way that you're a dreamcast guy um it is my favorite video game console of all time and i love having random little releases for it um and this is definitely a random one it was very unexpected now as you said i don't this is not as um revolutionary or maybe as um, as perfect as the Dreamcast or Genesis or um, Neo Geo CD releases in that you could pop those things into any system. You go to uh, you know, a game store, you buy a Sega Genesis, and you plug that cartridge in, and it will work. Uh, the same with the Dreamcast, the same with the Neo Geo. Um, those, that's special that you're able to do that um, there is a barrier to entry here, which is disappointing, 
Um, understandable because we do not have the technical ability um, to circumvent the anti-piracy protection on a GameCube um, as of recording. Well, uh, wait, wait, just to clarify that, you mean from a disc? From a disc, like, yes. It can't, yeah, obviously a mod chip or if somebody has yeah. like a GC loader, I mean, any of those things, fine. Yeah. But if you just take a stock retail GameCube with no alterations of any kind, as of now... There is no way to, with the disc alone, bypass the disc protection. Just yes. to be clear. Yeah. Uh, and and listen, I have a modded GameCube. That's why I bought this. You know, um, I do have the you know the ability to uh, to play this thing. Um, the interesting thing is that I will say um, is that Bitmap Bureau is also so you can buy the disc for the GameCubes on the little mini DVD. And it's in a GameCube case, and you know, and everything. Um, I think that was thirty U.S. Uh, I'm sorry, th- it's 30, thirty pounds, thirty pounds UK. And uh, but you could also um, download the ISO from them. You could purchase the ISO from them for fifteen pounds. Um, so you can, like, if you do have a, uh, you know, a uh, free mcboot or something loader. like that a way of playing games off of an sd card um you can't free mcboots for ps2 game, yeah free mcboots for ps2 but oh, i know no, what free, free, like, gc yeah, loader uh, whatever what's the uh, the gecko all that the, stuff yeah, yeah. Talking about. gc loader yeah yeah gc loader that's it that's it uh you know something like that um you can play the game through that mode too so i do appreciate that that they did give you the back door if you do have a console set up through sd card reading to be able to do it um i uh, but regardless i think it's super cool um it's interesting um i did not get the n64 version just because i like the system but i'm not a big super collector for the um i got the gamecube one out of morbid curiosity and obsession with getting every weird little gamecube thing yeah i haven't yet decided if i'm gonna buy them i probably will um but it's also at the same time, I own three versions of that same game. Yeah, you know, and I, like, I already and, have the Neo Geo CD version, so... Right. Like, I have the Genesis version, I have the Dreamcast version, I have the Neo Geo CD version. Like, I don't really need it, but I will admit the novelty of a new GameCube release does kind of strike me as fascinating. N64, kind of like you, I take it or leave it. I might get it anyway, just because, you know, what the hell, it's me. But... I, first of all, before I, we continue on this, Abdullah, did you hear about this? Does this anything? <laughs> is this interesting to you at all? I heard about it when you sent me the the, the list as well, uh, and I pretty much have a similar stance as Rob uh, because GameCube is also my favorite of all time. It's the console I grew up with, and the only reason I buy that is to to just add it to the collection. I uh, when I started video game collecting, I wanted to go for a full GameCube set, but that's pretty much uh, on the more impossible side, especially in these times. Uh, however, I may get it just for collection purposes. I don't even want to play it. Maybe I'll play it in time, but I'm not interested to play it as much as I am interested to get it. It does open the door to because it's the first one to be an independent release for a GameCube. It may open the door to other releases as well, which will hurt my pocket, but for the GameCube, it's fine. I'll do it. I'll do it for the GameCube. It's okay because I, as he says exactly, whatever GameCube item is in front of me, if I can't get it, I'll have an itch until I get it. And it's <laughs> you know it's it's impossible to get everything, but you know you try your best. Right. So that that's where I was going to go with it. it. I think it's kind of fundamentally interesting. We're all kind of on the same page about this. Like we all want it, but I don't think any of us want it to play it. It's just kind of like we want to have it because that's a neat idea, which yeah, maybe that in it. of its yeah, it's, it's a good yeah, game. exactly. It is, it is. I played it on the Genesis and I played it on the Dreamcast. It was great, um, but like I said, it's, I'm actually like it's it, it's in a weird way it pays dividends to me because I keep being in games that are now on like every system. So suck it, Rob, because technically I'm in that game. <laughs> um, but the, the, I guess the thing is like. Does that, first of all, that say something that we're just interested because of the novelty? But more accurately, as Abdullah was just hitting on there, do we think this goes anywhere, or is this just like a fluke, one-and-done type of thing? Um, I, I 
for the GameCube specifically, maybe. Um, I think you could see, you know, more little releases like this, you know, here or there. You, you could get something like a, uh, uh, yeah, I wouldn't even say like a limited run. Limited run wouldn't do that. They want their games to play, like, on boot up. They're like, no mods required. But, you know, if you go on to, like, Etsy right now or eBay, you're going to get, like, a ton of ROM hacks and weird little things for the N64, the Genesis, and um, little indie releases here or there. Um, not officially pressed and published. Bitmap Bureau is pretty good with doing things in not an official capacity, but in a semi-official, like, a good-looking capacity. Uh, with their releases, you know, they you know they did it on the AES and the MVS and the Neo Geo and Dreamcast, and it looks semi-official, but it's still you know a very niche thing. I really, I think the fact that you don't have that boot it right up, no problem on any system capability with the GameCube is really going to be a big enough barrier for entry for most people to just not give a crap. So you think this might just be, like, a one-off? They may not do this again? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, they, as in Bitmap Bureau. Bitmap Bureau, I think, has done, like, one game, right? <laughs> well, yes. Okay, so, well, so, all right, that's not fair. Yeah, I meant they, as in, like, anyone in the indie scene. Obviously, no major company is going to be making new GameCube games. You make a good point about limited-run games. I'm sure they would love to, but they do have a working relationship with Nintendo. But the question is, is it even possible? Like, is there still pressing machines that even exist for the GameCube anymore? Yeah, but but um, but but Nintendo won't let them do fucking Wii U discs anymore. Why would they let them do GameCube? That it, like, per, uh, for to be fair, I don't think Limited Run would w want to do Wii U games after the ones the horror they did. But you're right. I, I I think that they wouldn't allow that either. That actually presents a good point. By the way, this game there are a million modded Wiis out there that would be able to run this game. Yeah. So if you have a modded Wii, you should be able to buy this as well if you're interested. I, I'm, i like, curious. I'm just intrigued. You know, like, will anybody else care to make an indie GameCube game? Because this is the first time we've ever seen anybody do this. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if people at, like, Pixel Heart, they do all the... They do a bunch of Neo Geo CD. They do Dreamcast. They do some AES. They do some Switch stuff. It would not surprise me if they maybe gave it a shot. But the question is, like... Do you do, like, collections of games? Because the, the entry problem, as you keep saying, is really, really going to be key. I think that this this one release will be very interesting to see if anybody out there can get behind this concept. But then again, we live in a world where we've had not one, but two Nuon games re-released. Yeah. So it's not impossible. Um, I will take this opportunity, though, to say that it makes me wonder what the next thing is they put Xeno Crisis on. Sega um, CD, maybe that that would actually that would work. Like you could do that easily because yeah. they've already got a Genesis version. You could then add in the like the enhanced music you got from the Dreamcast Neo Geo CD version. That that could totally be done. I Atari, hell, I'd buy I, that. I, Atari Jaguar, they could probably get going. You know, Good. there's a time where I would have laughed at that, but the Jaguar scene is suddenly like alive. Yeah, there's a there's a like, lot of stuff coming out for that system. There's a lot. I actually got some at Midwest Gaming Classic. Like, it's it's kind of insane. Um, but, you know, I look at the more recent stuff. Like, yeah, I, I think there's probably a digital version of Xeno Crisis, like, on modern systems. But then I look at the other 6-gen stuff, and I'm like, we now live in a world where I believe you can do self-booting PS2 discs that are based off that, like, DVD exploit. Yeah. I don't know if that's something they could actually pursue or if they would... And then if you're going to do, you're just going to get to a point where you don't care if the system's modded or it requires it, there's really nothing stopping you from doing an original Xbox version because everybody had modded Xboxes anyway. Yeah. So, I don't know, man. Where but, I, th where I, th go ahead. Uh, by the way, uh, according to the Wikipedia, this is released on uh, Genesis, Nintendo Switch, PS4, PS Vita, Xbox One, Microsoft Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Sega Dreamcast, Evercade, Neo Geo, AES, CD, MVS, N64, and now GameCube. So there you go. It, so you it's, can play. You can go onto your Switch and play this. Yeah. Yeah. This this game is a slut, but that's fine. It's everywhere. Uh, I know because I'm in it. I'm a slut, so it makes sense. So so um, what's so what's the odds on a new one uh, uh, release for this? 
<laughs> New one? Dude. Oh my god. <laughs> I would be so happy. I don't think that's even possible. Like, does anybody have the development skills for a new one? Like, the new one, there is a thing, there is a website called the Nuon Dome that actually is about the indie scene for the new one, which, believe it or not, is a thing. Uh, but it's mostly like. I haven't. I don't know if it's been updated in a long time. As far as like new content, there's activity as far as like the forums and news. But like, I actually picked this up at PRGE last year. Somebody in the Nuon scene, like maybe 15 years ago, made a uh, self-booting Nuon disc that contained like versions of Doom, Atari 2600 emulators, like so much stuff. It is not impossible. That if they really wanted to make a new one version of this of Xeno Crisis, they could, I guess. But I guess you, you reach a point where you're like, really? Is that what we're doing? I don't know. I think that'd be awesome. But yeah. I guess if I had to go ahead. No, but yeah, I uh Wall would be awesome and I would buy it because I'm a terrible person. Um but I, I think realistically the the consoles that you could see the still release on would be you might be you could get like a Super Nintendo version because there are you know uh, tons of homebrews and stuff for that um, maybe a, probably a Sega CD is probably the most realistic one Atari Jaguar is pretty realistic um, but past that uh, yeah you're getting into pipe dream territory loopy conversion uh, conversion. Uh, not with Pippin that. Master Race. Pippin, Pippin Master Race. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I think if, I mean, I'm not them, obviously, and don't represent them in any way, but if I was them, I would think my number one priority would be to try to get a PS2 version. Yeah. Um, but I don't, the, the, that becomes a technical matter. Like, do you accept that the majority of people who buy the disc cannot use it in the case of 155 million user install base? Or well, they did, do they you. They do for the GameCube. The GameCube is... See, the thing is, dude, we're at a point now with the GameCube where, like, the majority of people who would even look at this already have hacked ones. It is easy enough to run hacked discs on a GameCube. Yes. PS2 discs are not easy to run. You know, you need a either a modded console, which a lot of people don't really have anymore, or you need to have, like, that old swap magic stuff, which nobody has anymore. <laughs> because the direction that PS2... Um, updates went was basically the exploit through the hard drive bay and through the usb ports nobody really gets around the disc problem that's why you can run like imports through the hard drive as long as they're digital but you can't run like an imported disc because free mcboot made that possible but it never was able to figure out how to bypass the actual disc drive whereas gamecube it's it's easy enough with like the gecko thing just plugged into it or a viper mod chip for it okay we're done it, it works it'll just read everything uh, so what I guess what I'm arguing is there is despite PS2 having a substantially larger number of systems, I would argue nowadays there are more people with the ability to read a GameCube disc off of a GameCube and a Wii that is key to that uh, that is pirated or non-legitimate than there are people who can read a PS2 disc like the yeah. actual disc. Now a PS2 version that is just an ISO that's another matter. You know, maybe people will be more on board with that. But then again, I don't know if you remember this, like a year or two ago, people started to figure out how to use the DVD exploit to actually get games to run self-boot on PS2, and then that project just kind of faded. If that is possible to pursue, then I think a PS2 version would not be out of the realm. Now, personally, I wouldn't really care that much about a PS2 version, but I would acknowledge that that would be news. Like, people would want that, just because it would be like, oh my god, a new PS2 game for the first time in, like, you know, since, what, 2012? I think was the last one? No, P no uh, 2013 was the last. Yeah. It's been 10 years. It's been 10 years since the last official, which I think was PES 2014. A European-only game. Yeah. Um... OG Xbox, I think you could totally do. It's more of a matter of, does anyone care? I would, but, you know, yeah. whatever. Um, anything. Uh, anyway, uh, Abdullah, anything else to say on this? No, nothing. Uh, so hopefully everybody out there, if you are interested in it, Google it. You'll find it. You could pick it up if you want to. I have no idea how many copies of this they produced. I would imagine like a couple hundred at most, to be honest, but... I guess we'll see. I I might have sort of convinced myself in this discussion to actually go buy it. I don't know, but uh, tell yeah, us down we'll in the see. comments what you want to see Xeno Crisis on. <laughs> yeah, what other systems do you want it brought to? Is it not on like iOS or Android? 
It's on Mac OS. But oh, it's okay. it's like a twin sticks shooter, so it's like you can't really do it on touchscreen. I guess that's true. I mean, unless you have one of those little controller adapters, but then you yeah. just start getting into that type of territory. The, the, the cool thing is, it is actually a good game. I just think it's funny that it's being used to like spearhead an entire independent movement, um, and the amount of stuff it's been on is just insane. Yeah, um, yeah. It's our kind of insanity. Oh, I agree. You know, I I like the fact that they're like committed to this. I always respect that kind of insanity. Uh, I think that that's very cool. But all right, uh, I guess that'll do it. So, uh, Chuck, thank you for not selecting that specific one, but you got the other one. It's all good. You guys get it. Abdullah, of course, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Joseph, earlier, for joining us. Spencer Perrier for his subject, as well as shout-outs to Luis Bonilla, Loke, Michael Kelly, Tim Inman, and Trey Wagner. Rob, I guess, thank you for your existence or whatever. What else? Um, yeah, whatevs. So if you guys could do us a favor, if you could like this video, comment down below, subscribe, of course, if you haven't done that already, as well as check out all the social media stuff in the description, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, Patreon, etc. Obviously Patreon, because then you can keep this going, as well as the other videos. We appreciate that support. But uh, as always, just thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you all later.